Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's February 2022, and this is episode 275, which is a spoiler-filled conversation about the app-based video series, The Chosen. Today's guest is Cole Burgett, who is a recent seminary graduate. He's also a graduate of Moody Bible Institute and the author for the website Christ in Pop Culture. Cole has written an online exclusive series review for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called King Laugh, Jesus of Nazareth in the Chosen. You can read his article for free at our website, equip.org, if you're one of our subscribers. If you do not subscribe and would like to read our online exclusive content, please go to our website, equip.org, to subscribe. Cole, it's good to have you on. Always good to be here. Thanks. Well, today's podcast is about this kind of a phenomenon, really. I don't know what to call it. It's not really television. It is streaming, but it's it's just a different delivery, I guess. And this is the Christian, I'm going to just call it a TV series, about the dramatization of the Gospels, really, and the life of Christ. And it's called The Chosen. And the goal is for the filmmakers to do seven seasons to really be able to bring to life the different parts of the Gospels that they want to. And currently, there have been two seasons that have already been filmed and are available for viewing. And more than 100 million people have watched those, or at least it's been streamed that many times. And they did raise money for season three, and they're currently raising money for season four. So I'm going to ask Cole a little bit about that later. But it is interesting that it has just gotten such a very big response. Now, it's not just that Protestant and evangelicals are watching it, but also other Christian traditions, in particular Roman Catholics. And it's been very popular among Christians, period. So, um, and especially for evangelicals, I think, in, in particular, I know there's a lot of merch around the show that people are wearing and so forth. So why do you think that this you know, show has really hit it off more than maybe the traditional Jesus films of the past? Yeah, um, I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination to suggest that we're a very uh, media-centric culture. And I'm not talking you know, just evangelicals here. I'm talking in general. Everyone has a cell phone, and chances are people are more literate in terms of, you know, Facebook and Twitter than they are with classic literature. It's just in the warp and woof of things now, for better or for worse. We very much live in the digital age. And uh, in the past 10 or 15 years, streaming services have really taken off. Most people, uh, statistics show, subscribe to some sort of streaming service. Uh, So there is clearly a desire for content Um, a desire for content that can be streamed. Uh, Now, that being said, uh, there is, broadly speaking, a dearth of Christian media, especially um, fundamentalist or evangelical Christian media. Uh, We are well beyond the days of, you know, the, the biblical epics of old Hollywood here. The powers that be in the movie and TV industries aren't so much interested in adapting biblical stories than they are doing uh, a revisionist take on the material. I think the last big film to come out was Exodus, and that was was something else. Uh, So my point in all of that is to say there's clearly an appetite in general for streaming content, and specifically there is a lack of content that is explicitly Christian in overtone. So when something like The Chosen comes along, that doesn't feel like a bad Hallmark movie knockoff, people are going to sit up and pay attention to it. And I think that uh, that's exactly what you see happening with The Chosen. I mean, it is far and away the most successful uh, crowdfunding project ever. Uh, People are, are going to pay attention to it by virtue of the fact that it isn't really competing with anything because there isn't really anything like it. It's the first uh, serialized telling of the gospel account or the life of Jesus, whatever you want to call that. Um, And there isn't really anything like it. And that's not to downplay the quality of the show because in in some ways I think it's, it's quite good and it's certainly better than it has any right to be. Um, It's, it's just reading the temperature of the room right now and recognizing that there isn't a ton of Christian media out there unless you count those, 
you know, God's not dead movies, which the less I say, the better. So. Well, I do want to ask you a little bit more about how the actual series got made, because you mentioned crowdfunding. Now, not all of our listeners might even know what that is if they're not familiar with, say, platforms like Kickstarter, which have birthed a lot of different projects from films to books to all kinds of things. And so people might not know what you mean by crowdfunding. And so not only is it crowdfunded, but it wasn't on a traditional platform for crowdfunding. So first of all, why don't you explain a little bit about crowdfunding and how can someone even watch this? I didn't even realize, I thought it was like streaming on Netflix. You talked about streaming. I did not realize that it had its own app or own place that you had to go um, watch the series. And do you think that it was helpful? You, you talked about, you know, it's, you know, we're gone are the days of old Hollywood of, you know, in terms of people receiving media from old, you know, Hollywood. So do you think that there are good things about the fact that it was crowdfunded and continues to be? And why do you think they went that route instead of, you know, with either streaming service like Netflix or Apple TV or even a major network, even a, like a Fox or an ABC or NBC? Uh, Sure. So we'll, we'll tackle this one in parts. Uh, Crowdfunding is, is just a, a new word, I guess you could say, for uh, crowdsourcing or alternative finance. So in, in other words, this the show is not uh, made by a major network. Uh, the show is very much independent in that people, people give money to have it made. Uh, it can be viewed, I think the service is called VidAngel. Um, it's, it's been a little bit since I've, I've actually watched it. Uh, but I, I, I know you can you can purchase a season uh, and that that purchase goes toward funding the next season, if that makes sense. Um, so you can purchase it and stream it, watch it whenever, and, and the, the money that you pay goes toward uh, production on the next season. Uh, and I, I think you can also download the chosen app on your cell phone and I think it can be streamed from uh, that app for free. Uh, that might have changed uh, lately, but I, as far as I know, that that's how a lot of people are, are watching it. Uh, and as far as not being tethered to any major network, you know, part of the reason that this really is sort of beneficial for them, I think, and they're they're smart. Uh, the showrunners and the creators and and how they're going about this. Uh, Part of the reason it helps them is that there is just hardly um, anyone funding this kind of thing. Part of the reason there's just no mainstream Christian media out there is because nobody's funding it. Uh, None of these major networks are funneling money toward evangelical Christian ventures, at least not overtly. Uh, There have been a a couple of Bible-based TV series in the past 10 or 15 years um, the TV show Kings, uh, which was a very interesting retelling of David and Goliath. And then there was a show that did abysmally in the ratings called of prophets of Kings and prophets. Uh, I think it aired on ABC and was canceled before season one ever finished. It had a uh, Ray Winstone in it. And then, um, History did their major miniseries, The Bible, and I think there was a follow-up to that as well. But those are few and far between. And the degree to which those uh, cater to evangelical sensibilities are up for debate. I mean, the History Channel miniseries just refused to even touch the Book of Revelation, for example. And there are some pretty obvious reasons for that. Um, Look, There is no getting around the fact that the word evangelical for the foreseeable future is synonymous with, you know, Trump thumping right wingers. I can't tell you how many articles I read in seminary from news outlets trying to explain what an evangelical is when most people who call themselves evangelical can't even agree on what it means. You know, I I mean, my gosh, I would consider myself evangelical one day and a happy fundamentalist the next. A lot of this stuff is quite arbitrary anyway, and we've largely gotten away from the original definitions, which doesn't help us at all. But I digress. 
at the end of the day, part of the reason you're not going to see mainstream evangelical Christian media is because in the eyes of many people, evangelicals are responsible for putting Donald Trump in office, which means they're a bunch of bigoted racist fear mongers who specialize in claptrap isolationism. Nobody who cares even remotely about their reputation, which is the currency Hollywood trades in by and large, is going to touch that. Um, so I absolutely think it's necessary, even wise, for showrunners uh, like the folks behind The Chosen who are interested in developing Christian media to do it in a way that is independent of the major networks. Uh, and crowdfunding or crowdsourcing uh, is one of the best ways to do that, at least until the temperature changes. It's, uh, it's a unique phenomenon, this, this crowdfunding thing uh, for the, the 21st century and the digital age. Um, it's just sort of unprecedented. And as a result, The Chosen is a fairly unprecedented show. Well, the creator and director and one of the co-writers of The Chosen is a guy named Dallas Jenkins. And if that last name is familiar to our listeners, his dad is very well known. And that's Jerry Jenkins, who is the Christian novelist behind the the Left Behind series, whatever you think about that. And as a matter of fact, the Christian Research Journal did a very in-depth review of the theology of the Left Behind series um, some years ago. It's available free on our website, equip.org, if anyone wants to read that. But it's so interesting. So along comes his son, Dallas Jenkins, and he is part of creating this series, has various religious consultants. So he has a Roman Catholic priest, a Messianic Jewish rabbi, and an evangelical who happens to be a professor of New Testament at Biola. And so there are some Christians who are concerned that this portrayal of Jesus may not be biblically biblically accurate because of the various different consultants that he's using. So should they be concerned about this theological input that Dallas Jenkins is receiving? I think there are a few perspectives on this particular topic. Um, first, I think you can look at it and appreciate the fact that the writers are selfless enough to go out and find people who actually have dogs in the fight and pull them in for discussion. Um, I, I wish Hollywood would do this just in portrayals of Christians in general. There are things when I watch TV shows that, you know, nine times out of 10, if you come across a Christian, they're going to be a Catholic. And then they say things that not even a Catholic would say. Um, I, I wish this kind of attention to detail would be paid you know, on, a, on a broader scale. By the same token, though, I think you have to recognize that there are key theological differences in what each group represented does with the man Jesus of Nazareth. Now, at the end of the day, I, I think we have to understand that these are not the gatekeepers of faith on the show. They are consultants, not showrunners. They don't get the last word. Uh, it's my understanding what each of these consultants do is participate in a few roundtable discussions to give their thoughts on character development and the portrayal of the first century world. I think we have to be smart enough people to realize that the writers are not sitting there with these three figures walking around like angry teachers, you know, whispering into their ears, you better change this or else. You know, that's just sort of immature and goofy. I mean, one of the consultants, the New Testament scholar, posted about what they do on the show and never once did you know theological input come up the shot callers are the showrunners and the writers and i think these guys are there because they all take the historicity of the individual of jesus christ very seriously and they want to see an accurate portrayal of first century life and you know i would say to any christian who just absolutely refuses to even watch a program that a catholic or a jew is associated with it they probably have some broader issues that need to be worked out most likely in therapy and that they should probably get rid of their televisions and streaming services in general and that tbn isn't the greatest thing since sliced bread we live in a very interconnected time and you're not going to get away from people who think differently from you and all things considered from what I've seen of the Chosen, Jesus is very much positioned as the Jewish Messiah, and he clashes heavily with the Pharisees over faith and works, just as recorded in Scripture. So if an evangelical is sitting there panicking because a Catholic or a Jew offered some creative input, I don't think you have much to worry about. Maybe that will change over the years as the show goes on, but I'm not inclined to think that it will. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast. 
Brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. This is episode 275 about the chosen. Well, if you missed it last episode, we spun the wheel again for our winner for our giveaway. And I want to make sure that winner is given their subscription to the Christian Research Journal before we start a new giveaway. And that winner is Dixie Morgan. So please contact us. We haven't heard from Dixie Morgan yet at webmaster at And we just want to remind you once again that we are super grateful to have you get the word out about this podcast, simply talking to a friend about it or sending an email or posting on your social media accounts a link to your favorite episodes. And if you can continue to do that, that really helps us out a lot. And as well as just inviting you to subscribe to the Christian Research Journal for thirty three fifty, You don't want to miss out on all these online exclusive articles like this one about the chosen. And then also we would ask that if that's not in your budget right now, We'd be super grateful for a tip, something small, every bit helps. So if it's only $3 or $5 or even $10, we'd really be grateful for your support. So thank you for all the ways in which you support our content. We were just talking about the various different religious consultants from various different Christian traditions that... Dallas Jenkins is interacting with. But one of the controversies, I guess, theological controversies surrounding the show is that he has made some very interesting comments when he's been interviewed uh, by Mormons, Latter day Saints. And, you know, there are again some Christians who are afraid that somehow Mormonism and the Mormons' view of Jesus is influencing how Dallas Jenkins is making the chosen and he is somehow communicating that he thinks Mormons have a Christian theology. So is this something that viewers should be troubled by? Uh, No, I don't think it is because I've gone back and listened uh, to the interviews that he's given on those respective podcasts. And it, I'm, I'm not quite sure if people are just misunderstanding him. Uh, But if anything, he seems to highlight the fact that he's not a Mormon and that there are differences between uh, Mormon theology and Christian theology and that there are reasons that he's not a Mormon. Uh, The facts are that The Chosen is filmed uh, on LDS land and that many of the uh, crowd-sourced backers, the, 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 the people who are giving money to the show, are in large part, LDS households. So it's not just uh, Christians who are are throwing money at the thing. And so he has gone on to a a few of these podcasts and done a few interviews with uh, LDS people. But from what I've seen and what I've listened to, and I know you and I exchanged uh, some emails about this pretty early on, and we sent, you know, actual transcripts of the uh, interviews. I, you know, I don't. I don't think he's. If you're, if the fear is that Mormons are secretly taking over the chosen, it, it's not happening. No, at least not from what I I see and understand and, and everything that's being said. I, I just don't see it. Um, so that that's kind of what I think. So I want to ask now just about comments that I've heard from Christians about why they've turned off the chosen. In other words, they started watching it and you know they thought the production values were excellent but they had real concerns with some of the artistic and creative liberties with the source material not in its actual telling of let's say this particular thing happened like the wedding at Cana where Jesus turned water into wine but that there's created some characters that aren't in the bible that are part of it and that there's some just backstories that are given to people that are recorded who existed in the Bible, not just the disciples, but other people like, say, Nicodemus, um, who's one of the Pharisees. And so Christians are very concerned about that, that it might really mess with what the Bible, how the Bible really truly portrays those people. Now, I know this is done all the time in books when there's historical fiction books, but somehow with the medium of film and television, it just seems a little bit more real, more visceral, more just easier to relate to, I guess, where you'd start thinking of, oh, maybe Nicodemus was 
like this. And instead of just the spare, you know, dialogue exchange, we don't really know anything about Nicodemus except for a few details in the gospels. And so it's like, you know, suddenly there's this huge backstory and his wife is involved and then just meetings that he's having with the Sanhedrin. And so all of those kinds of things, even from Christians who are artists themselves, they feel, you know, wary of watching this series. So how, how should someone think about these characterizations and the creative license that's been taken? Uh, well, I would say that it might seem more real, but that doesn't make it real. And the viewer uh, has to come to something like the chosen understanding that creative license is going to be taken. Uh, and I, I think because creative license is taken, the show is is all the better for it because it shows that Jesus's words were not just profound in a broad sense, but immediately cutting to the person he's speaking to. See, many adaptations will have Jesus recite the words of Scripture, but they're wooden and hollow because the writers know that he has to say them, but they have no immediate context. What The Chosen does uh, through creative license is give immediate context uh, because we've been with Nicodemus for several episodes and we know his struggles and we know what's at stake. It's not an arbitrary decision for him to meet Jesus at night and his conversation with Jesus, which contains the famous John 3.16 passage. Uh, it comes across as very powerful because it has context, immediate context behind it. Now, that context is not entirely drawn from Scripture. The bare bones are, because that's all that Scripture gives us. But the details are invented for the purpose of the show to give viewers an emotional connection to the character of Nicodemus. Now, does that harm us? Uh, only if we take it as gospel truth and blur the lines between reality and fantasy. Does it help us? Absolutely. In fact, I would argue that the show makes the emotional connection more pronounced so the viewers can really ground themselves alongside the characters, which can then encourage viewers to go back to Scripture, uh, what is in this case the source material, with a renewed appreciation for words that can sometimes become stale and less vibrant to us simply because we've heard them spoken so many times over in far more analytical capacities. Uh, you also mentioned uh, the, the Disciples. And the backstories of the disciples especially are, are fleshed out in ways that are simply not present in the gospel accounts. We learn about Matthew's history with Rome, for example, or Mary Magdalene's relationship with her father. These are interesting versions of these historical characters, and it's done in a way that is respectful of the biblical text, but in a way that is also different from what I think most of us have come to expect. The disciples are all younger, for example. I think we sometimes get these ideas that disciples were all late 30s to middle-aged men when Christ you know, ministered in his late 20s and early 30s. He was a young guy. And it just makes some sense that the people he surrounded himself with would, would be his age. At least some of them would. So the disciples are, are pretty you know, young, hip, if you will, in The Chosen. And their backstories reflect where they are uh, in life with some interesting twists and turns here and there. Again, it, it's not going to work for everyone, but if you can suspend disbelief, which, you know, is what you do any time you go to any other movie or any other television show, uh, I think you'll find a very different means of approaching these biblical characters in ways that aren't informed singularly by paintings or depictions in church plays. You know, you just mentioned Matthew as one of the disciples, and it's interesting. I feel like the show does give more like political focus, like more of the political environment of Jesus' day, specifically in his story, but just in general, where you, you know, hear, you know, see some of the backstories or maybe some of the stuff going around with the Romans in the area. So, do you think that? helps. I mean, I guess, you know, we could go to commentaries or read other outside things when we're reading the Bible to find out more about the political, um, you know, temperature and environment of the day. But do you think it helps Christians and maybe even those who are curious about Jesus who aren't Christians, you know, seekers understand the gospel and the Bible better by doing that? There was a, a story I heard in seminary. Um, a professor uh, was visiting with a, another professor who was retiring, um, who made some comments about uh, some of the, the the books that the, the retiring professor was clearing off of his shelf. And uh, he made a comment about, uh, I, I think, uh, some of the commentaries and the retiring professor's response was, read the Bible, it sheds a lot of light on those commentaries. And the, the point of that is to say that what many people will turn to is uh, commentaries to sort of explain the Bible. In other words, you can't read the Bible and get the, the biblical context 
on its own. And that's something over the over the years I've just come to embrace that you don't really need a lot of this these outside details. If it's important to the context, the narrative will give it to you. That's just kind of how storytelling works in the Bible. You know, what a shock does the same thing. So I don't think you necessarily need all of these details to understand the gospels themselves. Otherwise the details would be in the gospels if you needed to understand it. And it does give you enough to grasp what's going on. But it certainly helps to have a handling on the cultural and political climate of the day. The political games, the Pharisees, and especially Pilate play in the Gospels ultimately come to have a serious bearing on the narrative. So I think it helps people to have some understanding of what is going on in the broader first century Near East. It gives some context to the desires of the characters and their own expectations uh, for what the Messiah was supposed to do when he showed up. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, it certainly uh, helps viewers to become enmeshed in the first century world to, to get some of the more uh, political background. So just, you know, we were talking about artistic li- license, and I think, you know, anybody, especially when it's like a popular show and it's, you know, appropriate for families, the, the question for Christian parents is going to be, is this appropriate for my kids to watch? Because again, you know, to ask that question, will my kids find that these, you know, they're going to start thinking, oh, Nicodemus really thought like that, or this is what Matthew was really like. Matthew's portrayed in a very interesting way, I think. And so, you know, is that how he really was? Or, you know, and, you know, kids will glom onto a series or a scene or, you know, and this isn't trying to be a Disney film to be really popular with kids or Pixar or anything like that. But this dramatization of the Bible, would it confuse children and should parents be concerned? I mean, especially when I think of like the backstory, perhaps, of Peter, what made the miracle of the fish? I Actually, I thought that was very creative of them to think through, okay, what would make it really seem like a huge miracle that they were out and they were desperate and all of a sudden, um, you know, this miracle happened. So, you know, while we don't know why, uh, what were the, what was Peter's situation in his own job before he left to follow Jesus? I thought they did a creative job, but now suddenly would, you know, kids take that and be like, oh, this is what happened. And Peter was going into debt. And so then Jesus provided this big miracle. So should parents say, okay, let's watch this with my kids, or maybe do I need to pass on this? Well, I think it's a fair concern, but I think the buck doesn't stop with the chosen. If parents are concerned about their children not being able to separate for themselves the fictional details of any film with historical events, then they should probably exercise discretion in what they're showing their kids, period. Um, Honestly, I would not recommend the chosen as a children's program. There's nothing in it, you know, raunchy that kids can't watch. Uh, But I think the character development and the dialogue are a bit too complex for young viewers uh, to really grasp. And considering the fast-paced narratives of the day, I think The Chosen would come across as boring to most kids. Um, And the last thing you want to do for kids is make Jesus boring. So uh, I certainly think parents, you know, could watch it with their kids. uh, And, you know, if you need to have those discussions afterwards about, you know, what things are are real and what things aren't, that can be done. But I, I would not say that this is a show to sit down and watch with your children. I just, I don't think kids would... I mean, they could follow it, but I don't think they would find it very interesting or really understand the uh, the layers, uh, in a sense. So, now, in I want to talk about your review in particular. You um, specifically write about the show's portrayal of Jesus' personality, and I think this is a real big one when we look at different portrayals of Jesus in media, specifically, you know, movies and television series, and there have been various different ones over the years, the seventies, Jesus of Nazareth through the blue eyes. And even more recently in the last decade, we had Ewan McGregor portraying Jesus during his uh, temptation in the wilderness. And so there's this particular actor who actually happens to be Roman Catholic. And maybe the fact that he is Roman Catholic is some draw for people who are um, Roman Catholic, but he has a particular portrayal of Jesus. And so how does the chosen, you know, kind of want us to see Jesus? What what parts of him seem important to them to kind of bring out? And does the portrayal of Jesus 
fit with the Bible. Now, I would say the second season's a little interesting to me because I felt like the writing, at least in the first episode I watched the second season, was a little bit more casual and had a lot more 21st century idioms in it and those kinds of things. But I felt that the first season um, was a little bit, it didn't have that. I didn't notice that in the first season. And also Jesus, there was a lot of humanity toward him and he seemed more casual, a little bit more casual than perhaps maybe people see him in the gospels. Of course, this is going to be set Their Their goal is to be seven uh, seasons and we're only on season two here. So I don't know how the development of this particular portrayal of, of Jesus is going to go on, but you know, what do you think of how they've decided to portray Christ? Well, the first thing we have to admit is that scripture's portrayal of Jesus's personality is paper thin. Uh, this is not a criticism. It's just that we have to recognize that the writers of the Gospels are less interested in giving you a detailed biography of the man than they are telling you what they witnessed and trying to convince the reader that Jesus of Nazareth is the long prophesied Jewish Messiah. Uh, there is pretty much nothing in the Gospels that would lead me to talk about Jesus in the way most people talk about someone they know. I can't tell you his eye color, his hair color, or his height, though I can hazard some guesses. At the end of the day, they are guesses. I can't tell you the tone of his voice. I can't tell you his speech patterns. I can read words that he said, but I cannot begin to tell you how he said them. Most of our ideas about Jesus' personality come from other portrayals or depictions in artwork like those that you've just mentioned. I think the most popular image here in the West has got to be the Warner Solomon painting, The Head of Christ, which depicts this really fair-skinned Jesus with, you know, nice hair and a trimmed beard staring solemnly off into the ether. And that very mm. stoic and introspective image has really captured the popular imagination. Jesus, as portrayed in the Gospels, his purpose and his mission are clear, but the man himself is quite vague. He's more of an outline of a human being. What the chosen does is imagine the man's personality and it's done in a way that is very down to earth and commonplace casual as you note uh, and it definitely is a little more casual in the second season um, but, but it's commonplace in a lot of ways and i think some people have it in their heads that you know angels lit the path as the man walked and that simply isn't the case the show imagines the real human aspects of Jesus and gives him a very distinct personality. He is someone who can banter with his friends. He can laugh. He can deliver a deadpan one-liner. Uh, at the wedding, he dances. He's a little shy in places, but he's direct when he needs to be. More than anything else, I think The Chosen highlights his sense of humor which I actually do think is something you can see in the biblical text. In the Gospels, Jesus has a very cutting sense of irony that is quite hilarious. I mean, this is the guy who will look at a Pharisee and say, well, have you not read and paid attention to the law of Moses? It, he really is funny in places. And seeing those aspects of Jesus, the humanizing aspects, does not detract from his divinity. Uh it just makes him accessible as a man. And in fact, it serves to make his divinity all the more mysterious in some ways because you have a guy you can relate to who is in his essence also very alien. And that's a very rich texture when it comes to character development that is completely biblical and gives you a sense for just how strange it was for these people to suddenly have the realization that they were walking and talking with the Messiah. So in your uh, written review, you're, you mentioned that scriptures, you know, just like you were saying, distinct lack of clarity regarding his, the particulars of Jesus' personality. And you talk about um, the language that Christians often use about making faith, you know, a relationship, me and Jesus kind of stuff. And can you just explain for our listeners a little bit why our language can sometimes seem confusing or even tried as we try to define for ourselves who Jesus is. And I wonder if the lack of the clarity of details about his personality and the lack of a ton of 
actual details about the current political time, which, like you said, we can always go to commentaries, but the lack of it in the text itself is meant to make Christ and the issues that he was speaking to and the fact that he was the Messiah and what everything was about theologically more relatable in every time, culture, and space since he was on planet Earth. Yeah, this is interesting to me. All my life, um, growing up in a very dichotomized Christian environment, the one constant I always heard was it's a relationship, not a religion. And even as a kid, that struck me as somewhat odd. Now, let me be clear. I think I know what someone means when they hand me that cliche. The idea that I have to make individualized, personal decisions about where I put my faith. But the language we use is actually quite confusing to me. Uh, I've always been asked about my, you know, quote unquote, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I was asked this question in a job interview once, and it can sometimes really irk me. Look, the truth is, I have a more personal relationship with my coffee thermos than I do with Jesus. And I'm not being cavalier when I say that. I'm saying I just don't wake up every morning and sit down to coffee with Jesus. I don't pick up the phone and call Jesus when I need to talk to him. In fact, there are times when I pray that I get downright angry at the fact that it's such a one-sided conversation. And I think for anyone to pretend that they're walking around daily holding hands and singing songs with Jesus in the flesh is, like, delusional <laughs> and has a pretty serious misunderstanding of the second half of the New Testament and the role of this really mysterious character called the Holy Spirit. Uh, I genuinely wish that my relationship with Jesus was a personal one in that sense, but it isn't. And I think what happens when we hear about having a personal relationship with Jesus is that, one, we actually diminish what a personal relationship entails, and two, we create an impossible category for believers. I believe in Jesus. I depend upon his finished work, his death and resurrection, his sacrifice, and his imputed righteousness for my justification before the Father. And I very much look forward to the day when I can sit down to coffee with him, but that is not now. And to suggest that it is now misses the point of faith, it misses the point of hope, and it sidelines the very important work of the filling and the sealing of the Holy Spirit, who functions in the place of Jesus. And that's what he himself says in John 14. So I think we would do well to rethink how we think about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I don't have the same texture of relationship with the man that the disciples had, for example. Those guys had personal relationships. I don't have the luxury of walking and talking with Jesus, and it is a luxury. Remember what Jesus himself said to Thomas about those who have not seen yet still believe. It's a luxury. In some respects... You Can you even call it a relationship when you can't see, hear, or speak to the man in question? I'm, I'm not saying I have an answer for this, but the paradox and the contradictions in how Christians talk about this particular topic have always struck me, even from when I was very young, as odd. And in some ways, when I was younger, it, it actually made faith very inaccessible to me. And perhaps people talk about it like that, or at least evangelicals, is because there is not to paint a broad brush, but there is a, a, now you mentioned that Jesus has a more casual feel to him in just the relaxed feel maybe in this, but we approach the person and work of Christ as so cavalier that it's, it almost, we, we don't know how to really fully grasp around in our minds, the full divinity and the full humanity of Christ. And so we tend to kind of boil it down to some kind of American idea of what we think that word means in the context of relating to other humans, but not necessarily God. And so that's why people talk about that, because it is an odd cliche to say, well, you have, it's a a relationship, not a religion, because in fact, Christianity is a religion. 
So it is, I just wonder if it's some kind of, you know, slang American sensibility about trying to make sense of how we would relate to the theological truths that are presented in a, in a practical way, daily way, maybe. I think you're right. Um, I, I think that's a big part of it. I have actually tried to uh, look into the origins of that expression, of that cliché. It's a relationship, not a religion. Yeah, and it just just the idea of the the personal relationship, and it I, I really can't find where it it begins, but it it does seem to be a very um, modern American way of of framing you know concepts that are are tough to frame anyway. Uh, so in that respect, I, I understand it. Um, just like a lot of things in modern Christianity, I, I think it, at the end of the day, it, it's sort of a, a shallow glossing over of of the complexities of what faith actually entails. Um, I, like I sum it up by saying, you know, I've, I would like to have a personal relationship with Jesus. <laughs> and I look forward to the day that that actually happens. But uh, right now it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's left wanting. <laughs> well, and I think um, that, I mean, that might sound like almost not Christian to someone. When oh, absolutely. Oh, well, I, I get some funny looks on that one. Um, but I think, I think it's just that the word is not the, our definition of the word in the modern American sense is not the same as to what God really talks about throughout the whole exactly. Bible from the New Testament all the way through. I mean, even before the fall, right? When you talk about Genesis, I mean, God walked in the, you know, he at that point. God the Father doesn't have a body, but you know what I'm saying? The idea that the writer of Genesis was trying to say is that he was that personally involved, like he would go on a walk with Adam and Eve. And so in our minds, I think we try to uh, maybe Americanize that. And so we've, and so maybe watching in the chosen people try to think, okay, well, this might give me a better idea of who Jesus was, which has its, strong points when he was here on earth. And so, you know, just the, this idea of the filmmakers portraying him as being much more relational, maybe more grounded. I, I don't know that we've really, when the gospels, like you say, don't give us a lot of detail. We just infer what detail that we know. I mean, we know that Jesus is relational just from even a few th- few stories. I mean, when he goes to raise Lazarus from the dead, he cries. I mean, he, he knows that that's not what death is supposed to be, but I don't think we normally think in our minds of Jesus crying. I I will be interested to see how they handle that whole scene. If they decide to, I don't know that they're going to cover all the stories, but um, if they do it in the chosen, but so this relational view and talking about this word relationship and just maybe this more casual tonal feeling to who Jesus is in the chosen. Do you think that actually helps viewers to look afresh at Christ in scripture in a biblically grounded way that maybe is, shall we say, more emotionally accessible to them than say preaching? But I don't know that preaching should be, I mean, preaching is explaining God's word to us. And, uh, you know, we can start debating what preaching is, but, you know, some people look to preaching to be emotionally accessible. They want a pastor there that makes them. I actually had a friend that said that if I go place and my pastor can't make me laugh every Sunday, then I don't know that I want to hear him preach. I don't want to go to church like that. So I think our views of preaching vary also, but how does maybe the approach that the chosen takes make Jesus more emotionally accessible to the viewer? Yeah, uh, it's a good point. Uh, and, and let me cushion this with, by saying pre- preaching is something that fascinates me even while I don't quite understand what we do. I mean, even in seminary, I was trained to craft sermons and taught all of these rules about how to put a sermon together. And some of it's helpful, but most of it just comes across as arbitrary and unnecessary. And I'm not even convinced that what we call preaching today is what people like Paul did. Don't get me wrong. I love sermons. You know, I'm looking past my computer right now at a book of sermons by George MacDonald. I love reading sermons. I wish more people would manuscript their sermons. Uh, I, I love reading them. I think sermons can be very powerful from sinners in the hands of an angry God to sweet comfort uh, for feeble saints. But usually the dimension that is most inaccessible in sermonizing is the emotional one. And as you mentioned, that's really kind of not the point. 
Um, but it is why I encourage Bible college students or seminary students to use literature or movies as illustrations because narratives with emotional heft capture people and can demonstrate the, the point or the explaining. It can, it can, you can do the explaining through a narrative um, and, and it works really well. People remember that. You know, we don't actually care about the epiphany you had at your backyard barbecue. Uh, but we'll sit up and pay attention if you can draw me into a story with an emotional connection. Even better, if you can make that backyard barbecue feel like a life or death situation with emotional stakes, we'll be invested. And what the chosen does by leaning into the humanity of Christ is to uh, give viewers an emotional dimension to the man that had to be there simply by virtue of his being human, but that is often portrayed. Like you said, you know, we, we know that Jesus cries, but in the Gospels, we never see him laugh. Um, and, and many adaptations will keep Jesus vague and undefined, likely so as not to offend anybody. But the end result is rendering the man somewhat distant and aloof, and that's probably what plays into a lot of our modern perceptions of Jesus as this sort of, you know, almost like this distant, mystical, you know, figure. Yoda sometimes has more personality than Jesus in some of these things. But, you know, the Chosen portrays Jesus as a red-blooded human being who, like all of us, has a distinct personality with edges, and that's the key. I know we all like to think that we would all be best friends with Jesus, but the truth is some of us might find him annoying at times or hilarious because humor exists in that weird gray area of contradictory expectations. So yeah, I think it helps to make the character of Jesus more accessible to viewers, which can provoke them into considering or reconsidering the historical person. And it's my understanding uh, that that's, that's really what the, uh, the showrunners and, and people like Dallas Jenkins intend for the show to do um, is to, for people to sort of rediscover the historical person of, of Jesus and, and make some decisions on what to do with him, which is, you know, the heart of evangelism. So. And do you think some Christians would find the casual kind of nature and like even in season two in the opener, how he ends up teaching uh, two of the disciples a lesson who are thinking they're, you know, serving him in this great way and they're going to be more favored by him and that kind of thing. It, do they, do you think some people would say that, well, this kind of portrayal of Jesus is frankly blasphemous? Oh, I'm sure there's some people out there who think that, um, I, you know, I, I don't really know what to, to say to that person. If, if that's really how you feel, then, then don't watch it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's as simple as that. Uh, but to, to press in to the concerns, um, I think at the end of the day, you have to recognize that the man was a man. Um, he, he was also God, and he was also divine. But what of the, one of the things that the Chosen does uh, so well is it understands that the divinity of Jesus Christ is something that the, human, the humans who are with him are never going to fully grasp and understand. Um, and, and, and that was uh, the point I made earlier, that it, it sort of makes his divinity all the more mysterious. And you really get a good idea of just how strange it was for people to be sitting there talking to a human being, and then it suddenly dawned on them that they're not just talking to a human being. It really is bizarre. Um, and I, I don't necessarily uh, see that as being... Uh, blasphemous. I see it as taking creative license, but I understand that, you know, people have different views on that kind of thing. And if it really is a, a hang up for you and you just can't get past it, then I would say very simply stop watching it. Well, finally, on a much lighter note, I have a couple of fun, rapid fire questions for Cole, but also want to note for our listeners, the day that we're recording this is February 8th, which was the Oscar nominations. And one of the Movies, the films that Cole and I had a discussion about and Cole wrote a review of, is called Coda. And back in episode 251, we had an episode called Growing Up and Letting Go in Coda, which was nominated as a Best Picture this morning, as well as had an actor nomination, and maybe another one. So if you're interested in that film and interested in wondering if you should see it, then I would go and check out the review that Cole wrote for us back last summer. Well, Cole, finally, what would you say, well, maybe just today, is the best sandwich? 
the best sandwich. Oh, tuna. Tuna sandwiches are pretty good. And you're still at the beginning of the year. People are thinking about new beginnings. So what's something that you own that you really should throw out? <laughs> I have way too many books. <laughs> it's, it's an easy one. Well, thanks, Cole, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Always a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to episode 275 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Today's guest was Cole Burgett, who has written an online exclusive series review for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called King Laugh, Jesus of Nazareth in the Chosen. You can read his article for free at our website, equip.org, if you're one of our subscribers. Otherwise, you can subscribe to our magazine at equip.org. 